privilege to have Dr. Ron Rhodes back with us for session number six. Ron. Thank you. I know it's kind of hard after lunch, you know, it's, it's the time of altered states of consciousness. Uh, I remember those Bible Answer Man years, though. You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, you don't get to see the body language that takes place in the studio. Some hard question will come in, and people will be going. <laughs> you know? and I remember when I was doing the show with Hank for a couple of years, some hard question would be coming in, and I'd be, you know, and Hank would go, you know, he's the president of the organization. So he would say, Ron, what do you think about that? <laughs> Well, glad you asked, and then I'd give the answer. But uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, the Antichrist, and as a way of introducing that, let me just talk a little bit about a young couple that lived in a small house. And this young couple decided to go to a um, uh, midday lunch, and they drove away, and little did they know that there was another person watching them from across the street, behind the bushes. And this person ran around the back of their house and broke the kitchen window and started to crawl inside the kitchen when all of a sudden he heard a voice saying, I see you and Jesus sees you. It was a parrot. <laughs> so that didn't bother this thief too much. So we continued to break on in and he was about two thirds of the way in and the parrot says, I see you and Jesus sees you. Well, it didn't bother him, so we kept on breaking in, and he was all the way inside the kitchen by now, and he stood up, and he brushed all the glass off of himself, and the parrot says, I see you, and Jesus sees you. Attack, Jesus. And this... <laughs> you got it. This Doberman pincher named Jesus mauled the guy. And no one ever heard from that man again. <laughs> now that is a different Jesus. Would you agree? But as bad as that Jesus is, it's not near as bad as this figure that we call the Antichrist, who will emerge during the tribulation period. And what I want to do today is talk a little bit about him. And we'll be moving pretty quickly. This is a, a shorter session than this morning. And, uh, you know, what we're going to do is just sort of cover the big picture on some of this stuff. So the first question that comes up is, what are some of the different concepts people have about the Antichrist? Some people have said he is a myth. He doesn't really exist. In fact, I grew up in a liberal church, and that's what they thought. When I was a young child, I was a member of a liberal church. Bible wasn't the word of God. Jesus wasn't God. Antichrist is just a myth. And I, I eventually became a believer in Hollywood, California, of all places. Can you imagine that? Anything good could come out of Hollywood? But there I was. I became a believer. And you know what it was that got me turned on to, to the Lord? It was Bible prophecy. So that's kind of cool. Bible prophecy can play a big role in evangelism. Anyway, uh, these individuals deny that the Antichrist even exists. And the big problem with that is that when you look at the prophecies in the Old Testament that deal with the first coming of Christ, they were all fulfilled literally. I mean, prophecy... Is, is literally fulfilled. And that leads me to believe that all the prophecies that deal with the second coming and all the events and persons that lead up to the second coming are just as literal, which means that we must believe in a literal antichrist. There's other people who have tried to describe the antichrist as an institution of evil. you know. And uh, one example of that might be the early Roman Empire. Now, you remember how the Romans, they used to put Christians in a big arena and send the lions in. Okay, that's antichrist. Uh, Islam has also been suggested as an institution of evil that could be categorized as antichrist. Still others categorize it as a personification of evil. Now you all know that Uncle Sam represents America. I want you. You know, you've seen that picture. Uh, and likewise, I remember um, um, one particular pastor who holds this view was talking on television and talked about how the antichrist is just a general term that personifies all evil. So whether the evil is what Hitler did or whether the evil is like the, the terrorists flying planes into the, the Twin Towers, that's an example of the personification of evil in our culture today. But he's not a real person, you see. Well, again, I think he is a real person. And I think that what you and I need to do is to take a biblical approach. Do I hear an amen on that? Amen. You know, I'm reminded of the little second-grade girl who 
came home from Sunday school and she was just so excited about what she heard. She was just bubbling over with enthusiasm and her daddy said to her, well, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And she said, oh, daddy, it's just so cool because, you know, we learned about how God created Adam first. And God saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone. And so God put him asleep and then took out his brains and made a woman of them. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. That's right. And all the women said... <laughs> No, nah, that's in second illusions. That's not really in the Bible. You know, we really must take a biblical approach. That's an amusing story, but it's not really in the Bible. Okay? Not really. And if you take a literal approach in, in understanding the Bible, you come out with the idea that the Antichrist is a real person, a genuine, real person. Could even be alive today, although we're not sure about that. He's called the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. And in the book of Revelation, he is portrayed as a person. He speaks as a person. He acts like a person. And he is treated like a person by other people. So I don't see how you can approach the book of Revelation in any other way. Uh, granted, there is symbolism in the book of Revelation. But when the, the, the text of Scripture speaks about the Antichrist, I mean, he comes off as a real, genuine, red-blooded person. Now, what does the word anti mean? If we're going to talk about the antichrist, what does the actual term mean? And the Greek word can mean instead of, or it can mean against or opposed to. And so what we can conclude from this is that the antichrist literally means instead of Christ or against Christ or opposed to Christ. Now, how would he be instead of Christ? Well, he would set himself up in place of Christ in the sense of trying to set up his own kingdom, Right? And he's against Christ in the sense that he stands against everything that Christ represents. He's unholy instead of holy. He has a diabolical purpose instead of a good purpose. He persecutes the Jews instead of wanting to bless the Jews and so forth. So in that sense, he is opposed to Christ. Well, what is the distinction between spirit of Antichrist, many Antichrists, and the Antichrist? Now, I'm sure some of you have read through John's epistles, right? You, you're familiar with those epistles, right? Okay, good. A couple of you read that. It's always good to read the Bible from time to time. Uh, actually, it's good to read it every day. You ought to be in the Bible every single day. And, uh, you know, the Bible indicates that even when John was writing his epistles, the spirit of Antichrist was already at work. In fact, he says... Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. And of course, back in his days, one of the problems that John was facing was kind of like a pre-Gnostic heresy. And there was one particular person by the name of Serenthus. You don't have to remember that name. You don't have to write it down or anything. But this is a guy, he's kind of a Gnostic-like guy, who taught that Jesus was just a human being. And at his baptism, the cosmic Christ came down on him and indwelt him and stayed inside him for three years. And then right before the crucifixion, this cosmic Christ left Jesus. You see, that's a different Jesus. You know, John is saying, this is Antichrist. If you say that Christ did not come from God and has not come in the flesh, that's Antichrist. Now, we've got the same kind of stuff today. We've got the spirit of Antichrist among us. And any time you encounter false doctrine or false religions, especially redefinitions of Christ, well, you've got the spirit of Antichrist at work. There's also the reference to many Antichrists in Scripture, in John's writing. He says, children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now, this would refer to false teachers and false prophets and false apostles and leaders of cults. Now, those of you who are familiar with some of my other books know that I'm very involved in apologetics. And, of course, when I was at the Christian Research Institute and did the Bible Answer Man show, we dealt with a whole lot of cults, okay? And so I'm very, very familiar with the leaders of these false religions. And many of them are familiar with me. We've had a lot of interactions through the years. And I'm happy to tell you, this is just sort of an aside thing, but as a result of our ministry, we've been able to reach virtually thousands upon thousands of those who have been in bondage to the kingdom of the cults 
and have now come to know the true Messiah in, in the kingdom of light. So that's good news, isn't it? I, I take delight when I see somebody that's locked in the kingdom of darkness who comes into the kingdom of light. It is absolutely awesome. But anyway, these false prophets and false teachers are deceiving untold millions of people in our culture. And this would be what's meant by many antichrists. Now, all of this is distinct from and different from the antichrist. This refers to a single individual who emerges into power at the outset of the future tribulation period. He is the embodiment of all that is anti-God and anti-Christian. He is the supreme antichrist. <coughs> And he will position himself as being instead of Christ, against Christ, and opposed to Christ. He will set himself up against Christ and the people of God in the last days prior to the second coming. Now, who in history has been accused of being the Antichrist? This is kind of interesting. Oh, you thought I was asking you the question. I bet you could give me some interesting answers, couldn't you? Uh, first of all, Roman emperors have been accused of being the Antichrist, and I'm talking about uh, these individuals who set themselves up as God. As you know, the Roman emperors wanted to be worshipped as God. They demanded that people would address them as God, and as God, they persecuted Christians who believed in a different God, a God called Yahweh. And as a result of that, as a result of Christians refusing to worship the emperor, they were executed, and sometimes it was the lion's den, other times they would tie Christians up on poles and, and pour fuel on them and light, light them up at night. And so the Christians would actually serve as lamps, uh, you know, that, that decorated the Roman streets there. Uh, also, Roman Catholic popes have been accused of being the Antichrist through the years. This is a common claim, one pope after another. And even today, there are those writing books who say that the current pope is the Antichrist. Uh, Judas Iscariot is an individual often claimed to be the Antichrist. And there are some who believe that this individual will actually be brought back from the grave in the end times, and he will be the Antichrist. And we read in Luke 22, 3, that Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot. Likewise, we know that Judas is called the son of perdition, just like the Antichrist is in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. So just as both are called the son of perdition and both are indwelt by Satan, well, that must mean that Judas is the Antichrist, right? No. No, that's just bad logic. That's, bad. that's coincidental. More recent identifications, people like Napoleon and Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini, Boris Yeltsin, John F. Kennedy, Henry Kissinger, Michael Gorb or Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton was once claimed to be the Antichrist and the false prophet was Hillary. That's what one theory was. You know. it's like a, like. There, there are some who say it was Prince William. I don't know how they bring Prince William into it unless it's just the idea that he will one day be the king of, of uh, you know, Britain. But, I mean, that's just... Uh, who knows the logic that goes into this? And of course, more recently, Barack Obama, there was a, uh, <laughs> some of you said, yes. <laughs> you guys are funny. There was a Harris poll that was taken some time back in which 24% of Republicans claimed that Obama was the Antichrist. And more generally, 14% of Americans claimed that Obama is the Antichrist. And there was actually a YouTube video that went viral. It got millions of hits. A lot of people downloaded it, and so it took so many hits that one of the professors over at Dallas Theological Seminary, by the name of Daniel Wallace, decided to debunk it. And so he wrote this long article debunking the idea that uh, Barack Obama was the Antichrist. Now, he's no fan of Barack Obama, but fair is fair. He wanted to point out that theologically speaking, this is just not a, uh, a good idea. And so, you know, there's a warning to the wise here. So far, the track record has been 100% wrong. And besides, we, uh, we are told in 2 Thessalonians 2 that uh, you know, the, the man of sin, the man of perdition, will not be revealed into the tribulation. So if you know who the Antichrist is, you've been left behind. Okay? <laughs> the next event on the timetable is the rapture, which could happen any moment. There's no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before that. And by the way, I'm talking about that tonight. That's going to be an exciting time right after dinner. 
Uh, the key identifier of the Antichrist occurs after the rapture when the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel. And so, like I said, I think that we're going to be long gone. In what ways does the Antichrist mimic Jesus Christ? Well, you know, I could spend the next three hours talking about this. But again, you know, Joe Bell didn't give me three hours to talk about this. I've just got to uh, really until about uh, a little bit after four. And so I'm going to sort of hop right into this. In what ways does the Antichrist mimic Christ? Well, Christ appears in the Millennial Temple, whereas the Antichrist appears in the Tribulation Temple. Christ is God. The Antichrist claims to be God. Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Antichrist has a mouth like a lion, meaning that he, ha meaning that he has powerful words. Christ makes a peace covenant with Israel. The Antichrist makes a peace covenant with Israel. Christ causes men to worship God. The Antichrist causes men to worship Satan. Christ seals his followers on the forehead. The Antichrist seals followers on the forehead or the right hand. Christ has a worthy name. The Antichrist has blasphemous names. Are you starting to see a pattern here? He really is anti-Christ. Christ is married to a virtuous bride, and that's you and me, or the church, the bride of Christ. The Antichrist is married to a vile prostitute, the false religion. The Christ is crowned with many crowns, whereas the Antichrist is crowned with ten crowns. Christ is the king of kings, whereas the Antichrist is called merely the king. Christ sits on a throne, just as the Antichrist sits on a throne. Christ rides on a white horse, just as the Antichrist rides on a white horse. Christ has an army, the Antichrist has an army. Christ suffers a violent death, the Antichrist appears to suffer a violent death, and I'll talk more about that later. Christ was resurrected, the Antichrist appears to be resurrected, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. That's a controversial area, so we'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, also, Christ will return from heaven, the Antichrist will return from the bottomless pit. Christ will rule over a 1,000-year worldwide kingdom, whereas the Antichrist will rule over a three-and-a-half-year worldwide kingdom. Christ is part of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whereas the Antichrist is part of an unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And I think that you can see from this that there are many ways in which the Antichrist seeks to mimic Christ, but in an evil way. You see, so when we look at the term Antichrist and understand that it means in place of Christ and instead of Christ, uh, those meanings really come clear when you look at these characteristics that we've just examined. I do see some of you trying to take notes. I want to make something available to you, and it's, it's up to you as to whether you take advantage of this. But for those who are interested, I am going to be making PDF copies of each of my PowerPoints that I can send to you after you send me an email. I will not put you on an email list, okay? You will not be on a fundraising list. All this will be is if you want a copy of the PDFs for these PowerPoints, you email me, and I'll send it to you free of charge, and that's the last you'll hear from me unless you email me again, okay? And so my email address is ronrhodes at earthlink.net, R-O-N-R-H-O-D-E-S at earthlink.net. So feel free to, to, to send me an email about that, and I'll email these to you. Number six, what are some dissimilarities between the Antichrist and Christ? Well, this gets interesting, too. Obviously, Christ is called the Christ, whereas the Antichrist is called the Antichrist. That's a good beginning point. But beyond that, Christ is called the man of sorrows, whereas the Antichrist is called the man of lawlessness. Christ is the son of God, whereas the Antichrist is called the son of destruction. Christ is called the lamb. The Antichrist is called the beast because of his evil character. Christ is called the Holy One, whereas the Antichrist is called the Lawless One. Christ came to do the Father's will. The Antichrist came to do his own will. Christ is energized by the Holy Spirit. The Antichrist is energized by Satan. Christ submitted to God, whereas the Antichrist defies God. Christ humbled himself. The Antichrist exalts himself. Christ cleansed the temple. The Antichrist defiles the temple. Christ is slain for the people. The Antichrist slays the people. 
Christ was received up into heaven, the Antichrist goes down into the lake of fire. Now you can see that those are some pretty noteworthy distinctions. And again, we can come to understand the meaning of the term Antichrist. Instead of Christ, in place of Christ, you see, he's setting up his own devious kingdom. He is against Christ in just about every way possible. And it's, it's true in his character, it's true in his identity. And uh, for those interested, I do uh, have this book called Unmasking the Antichrist, in which I tell you who he really is, what his name is. No, I'm kidding about that part. <laughs> Nobody knows who he is, but I give you everything you know that you need to know biblically, and I want to emphasize biblically. I don't like speculation. I don't like just mere man-made ideas when analyzing Bible prophecy. I feel we need to be absolutely biblical in all things. Does that make sense? I think that it's really important for us to do that. And so that's what this book is about. It's a biblical treatment of the Antichrist. Now, is the Antichrist a Muslim? Can I tell it to you real? <laughs> somebody said yes and somebody said no. That's kind of funny. <laughs> this is one of those areas where we need to agree to disagree in an agreeable way. And I say that because this is a controversial area. There are some Christians who think that the Antichrist is a Muslim, and there's other Christians who deny that. And I'm in that latter group. I don't think that he will be a Muslim. But one of the guys that's promoting this theory is a guy by the name of Joel Richardson. He's written some books on this, and I consider him a friend. You know, we're both brothers in Christ, and I've been with him. I've spoken with him. I've spent time with him. And I don't, commit his, uh, I don't doubt his commitment to Christ a bit. I think he's a godly person. But he knows very, very much that I think that he's wrong. And he thinks that I'm wrong. So we're, we're continuing to dialogue on all of this. But let me just tell you the reasons, pro and con, on this issue. All right? And so I'll tell you where I come down in just a moment. Let's first look at the case four. And by the way, this is a very brief treatment. Uh, really, I'd take two or three hours in just talking about this alone, but I've only got a few minutes here. So in terms of the case for the Antichrist being a Muslim, uh, there are some similarities that are claimed in terms of the uh, Antichrist and the Muslim Mahdi, or the 12th Imam. Both are portrayed as end times political, military, and religious leaders. Uh, both are portrayed as subduing the earth by a powerful army. Both are portrayed as establishing a new world order. Both are portrayed as establishing new laws for the earth. Both are portrayed as instituting a world religion, and in the case of uh, the Mahdi, it would be the Islamic religion that he would establish. Both are portrayed as executing people who don't submit, primarily by beheading. Both are portrayed as seeking to kill Jews. Both are portrayed as seizing and conquering Jerusalem. And there's much more to it than that, but the conclusion is, is that the Antichrist will be a Muslim. That's the idea. These are some of the basic kinds of arguments that are suggested. It's all based on similarities that the Antichrist might have with this Muslim Mahdi, who is like a counterpart to the second coming of Christ. You know, well, what about the case against uh, the Antichrist being Muslim? I want you to remember something that Solomon once said. Solomon said that the one who studies his case first, or who states his case first, seems right until the other comes and examines him. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. You see, what you want to do is to make sure that you test everything against Scripture, Right? The scriptures are our barometer of truth. And upon examination, I believe that the Muslim Antichrist theory has a number of problems. And I've shared some of these with Joel. Uh, first of all, Islamic eschatology is contradictory. It's not consistent. Almost all Islamic eschatology or prophecy is, is in Muslim tr tradition and not the Quran. And it is all over the map. You've got all kinds of different ideas represented in Muslim eschatology. And so, therefore, to write books that portray Muslims as having some kind of a cohesive, coherent, prophetic outline uh, is just not fair to what the, what the Muslims really believe. I mean, Muslim traditions have just all kinds of different ideas on eschatology. And so that's, that's sort of a foundational issue. Furthermore, Muslims actually disagree among themselves about the role of the coming Mahdi. Uh, again, the Mahdi is allegedly going to be the Antichrist, and the Shiite Muslims believe that the Mahdi is now on earth, but he is in hiding and will soon come out of the closet. There's others who are the Sunni Muslims who believe that the Mahdi has yet to emerge in human history. And I think that these books written by Joel and others, and I've told Joel this, 
uh, tend to ignore these kind of conflicting ideas about the nature of this individual. Furthermore, we know for a fact, as Tommy shared this morning, that uh, you know, Muhammad was originally a businessman who went on caravans for his uh, rich client, who eventually became his wife. And when he went on these caravans, he encountered Jews and Christians, and he had discussions with them. And then he had, a lot of these discussions were about the end times, and so actually uh, Muhammad got a lot of his ideas about prophecy anyway from some of the Jews and the Christians that he encountered, talking about the books of Daniel and First and Second Thessalonians and Revelation and so forth. And so actually, any eschatology that does exist that came from Muhammad was borrowed from Christians, and so it wouldn't be unexpected that there be some similarities in Islamic theology about some of this stuff. Furthermore, the Antichrist will sign a covenant with Israel. Why would a Muslim leader want to protect Israel with a covenant? You know, inquiring minds want to know. Why would a Muslim leader want to do that? Muslim leaders want to push Israel into the sea. They want to wipe Israel off the map. Most Muslims today hate the Jewish people, and they want the land of Israel back. Make no mistake about it. This is not just some political issue. It's a religious issue. It is a religious issue. And Muslims believe that Allah promised that land to them through Ishmael. And in fact, Muslims claim that the Jews changed the Old Testament so that the line of promise would come through Isaac. You know, they, the Muslims say that that wasn't in the original Old Testament. The original Old Testament goes through Ishmael to the Muslim people, the Arab people. And so they want the land back, okay? So why would a Muslim sign a covenant with Israel protecting their right to be in the land? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Furthermore, it's inconceivable to me that Israel would trust its security to a Muslim leader. You know, I mean, did you, see, you hear Netanyahu the other day? <coughs> He certainly doesn't trust the Muslim leaders right now. And so I, I think it's just troubling any way you look at it. Still further, we know that the Antichrist claims to be God. That's very clear in Scripture. Daniel 11.36 tells us that the Antichrist shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And 2 Thessalonians 2.4 tells us that the Antichrist ultimately exalts himself and takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now listen, folks. Would a good Muslim claim to be God? What would a Muslim do to somebody who did claim that? <laughs> Chop his head off, probably. You see, that's the worst kind of infidel, because, you see, Muslims believe that Allah is so separate from the earthly realm that you can't even use earthly words to describe him. So this idea of there being a, a, you know, God or Allah in, in human flesh, I mean, that's just anathema to the Muslim mindset. And so no good Muslim would ever claim to do this. That would be a trashing of the Muslim creed, which says that there's one God named Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And uh, still further, um, how can this Antichrist Muslim hypothesis be feasible with an Ezekiel invasion, which I talked about this morning? You know, you're going to have all these Muslim nations that invade Israel, and then God is going to take out these Muslim invaders from Iran and Turkey and Sudan and Libya and Russia. You see, God will annihilate the Muslim invaders. And uh, Ezekiel 38 39 seems to indicate that these countries may be reduced to ashes. So how could a Muslim leader emerge on the world scene out of the ashes of a destroyed Muslim coalition? Here's what makes more sense to me personally. Okay, As I look at the data, the Christians have been removed at the rapture before the tribulation. And I believe that God will destroy these Muslim armies that invade Israel either at the beginning of the tribulation or before it, you know, sometime after the rapture and before the tribulation begins. Now, here's, here's why that's important. This makes it much easier for the Roman Antichrist to emerge and promote a false one-world religion. You see, what are two of the big people groups that would stand against the emergence of a new religion? Christians and Muslims. Those are two groups that just wouldn't take it. But if the Christians have been removed at the rapture and Muslims have been largely taken out at the Ezekiel invasion, that means that the two primary religious groups that would stand against the emergence of a false world religion have now been taken out of the way. So that makes it much easier for the emergence of the Antichrist and his false religion. And I think it also makes it easier for the Jewish people to rebuild their temple because there will be very little Muslim resistance at that point. Does that make sense to you? 
It just seems like it, it, it just flows a lot better that way. Uh, get all the facts. Here's some books. And, uh, you know, these books, again, are marked down. I have no interest in making profit off of this. I've marked it down uh, over 30%. And so the, their price, I, I'm basically giving it to you for, you know, about what I got them for, you know, when you add the shipping into it. So I hope that you take advantage of this. It's cheaper than you're going to get it at any bookstore. Uh, number eight, is the Antichrist a Jew or a Gentile? This is another one of those questions that people love to debate. And early tradition says that he will emerge from the Jewish tribe of Dan because Dan was involved in idolatry. That tribe was involved in idolatry. And furthermore, Revelation 11.8 says that the seat of the Antichrist dominion will be the great city where the Lord was crucified, Jerusalem. So therefore, he must be a Jewish person. Well, that's not good thinking. You know, there's not a single explicit statement that he will be a Jew. Furthermore, Revelation 13.1 tells us that the Antichrist will rise up out of the sea, and the sea is defined for us in Revelation 17.15 as being peoples and multitudes and nations and language. In other words, he will be a Gentile. What kind of Gentile will he be? Well, he will emerge from the people that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Now, who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple? The Romans. He's going to be a Roman Gentile. Furthermore, he's going to be a Gentile who is a cruel persecutor of the Jews. He's not a Jew himself. He wants to kill the Jews. He wants to persecute them. Why would a Jew want to destroy the Jews? That just doesn't make sense. So as an individual who will be a Roman Gentile who heads up a revived Roman Empire, and he will persecute the Jewish people and the saints of God. Well, what do we know about the character of the Antichrist? Well, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. First of all, he has a strong appearance. Uh, the whole world will marvel to see the beast, according to Revelation 17:8, and he will be greater than all other national leaders, Daniel 7:20. He will be one who understands riddles, Daniel 8:23, and what baffles other people will seem like child's play for him. He will have a Satan energized intellect that enables him to, to, to think more clearly than anybody else, even though it would be a perverted mind, mind that he has. He will have great oratorical prowess. You know, you've heard some of these preachers that can get into the rhythm and they get to drive the crowds up into a frenzy. I mean, you've heard this, right? Well, this guy will be able to do it better than anybody else. He will be a great speaker. Daniel 7, 8 says that he will have a mouth speaking great things. And uh, Revelation 13, 2 says that he will have a lion's mouth meaning that he will have powerful speech. He will have governmental prowess. World leaders will be handing over their royal power to the beast, Revelation 17, 16, and he will attain world dominion. He will have commercial prowess. One cannot rise to global dominion without being an economic genius. No one will be able to buy or sell anything without receiving the mark of the beast. And by the way, let me mention to you that should you happen to be in the tribulation, and, and you witness somebody taking the mark of the beast, it seems to me that that is a definitive point at which there's no further salvation for you. You know, I generally teach people that you're, you're eternally secure, and uh, until the day that you die, you have the opportunity to turn to Christ and to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the text of Revelation seems to indicate that if you receive the mark of the beast, that point cuts off right there, that you are from that point forward assigned to eternal perdition. And so that's a sobering reality to consider. Uh, Revelation 6.2 tells us that he will come out conquering and to conquer. So he will have military prowess. People will say, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? He will be defiant. He will be prideful. In Daniel 11, we are told that he will do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. And then in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, he opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, even proclaiming himself to be God. He is diabolical to the core. He will break the covenant he made with Israel. He will persecute the saints. He will kill God's two witnesses. He will force the world to worship him as God. He will bring the world into economic bondage and cause all the nations to move against Jerusalem. Boy, that sounds like a bad dude, doesn't it? He is bad. What about the titles of the Antichrist? Well, he is called the Beast. That should tell you just about everything you need to know right there. He's called the Beast. In fact, he's called the Beast 32 times in Revelation, 
and he's portrayed as brutal, bloody, uncontrolled, and wild. And of course, this contrasts with Christ as the Lamb of God. The word lamb points to the gentleness of Christ, whereas the term beast tells of the ferocity of the Antichrist. The lamb is the savior of sinners. The beast is the slayer of sinners. He's also called the man of lawlessness. He is the virtual embodiment of lawlessness. And this is a clear contrast with Jesus Christ, who is the righteous one. When Jesus entered the world, he came into the world saying, Behold, I have come to do your will, O Father. But the Antichrist shall do as he wills. He does whatever he wants to do. And then finally, he is called the son of destruction. The son of destruction, also translated son of perdition or son of hell. And this carries the idea that his destiny is to inherit perdition, whereas by contrast, Christ inherits heaven. What is the role of Satan in the Antichrist? As I've got five minutes left. Let's, let's look at this very quickly. Uh, I think that Satan is very, very active. And see, you see this little sign up on the right? Yeah. <laughs> Satan inside, that's right. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 tells us that the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. So basically, he's going to be energized by the devil. The Holman translation says it's based on, he is based on Satan's working. Uh, according to the NKJV, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. The expanded Bible says the coming of the lawless one is in accordance with the work and activity of Satan. And then in Revelation 13, 2, we read that to the Antichrist, the dragon, or Satan, gave his power and his throne and great authority. So the devil will be manifest in him. Now, Satan's nature is reflected in the Antichrist. We know that Satan is our adversary, our enemy, the evil one, the father of lies, a murderer, the god of this world, and the ruler of this world. And in the same way, the Antichrist will partake of these kinds of qualities. For example, we know that the Antichrist will have the same kind of pride that the devil does. In Ezekiel 28, it says of Satan, your heart was proud because of your beauty. But down in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, we read that the Antichrist exalts himself as God. His heart was exalted. Like Satan, like the Antichrist. Satan is a deceiver. He's the father of lies. Likewise, the Antichrist is a deceiver. 2 Thessalonians 2.10. Satan is a persecutor of Christians, according to 1 Peter 5.8. And likewise, the Antichrist will be a persecutor. He will make war on the saints. Now, what about this one? Does the Antichrist die and then get resurrected? My friends, let me tell you like it is. This is one of those issues where we need to agree to disagree in an agreeable way. I say that because Christians disagree on this issue. Some Christians say, yes, he dies and he gets resurrected. Others say, no, he doesn't truly die. And uh, the other explanation that says he doesn't truly die goes like this. You might remember the Apostle Paul who was stoned and left for dead. Remember that? That's in Acts 14. He was stoned and he was thought to be dead. And many people, many theologians believe that at that point, his spirit was caught up to heaven in 2 Corinthians 12, where he heard inexpressible things that cannot be repeated about the heavenly realm. Now, by contrast, there are those who believe that the same thing might be true in reverse with the Antichrist, that he will be thought to be dead by a mortal wound, but in fact, his spirit has gone down into the abyss where he receives instructions from Satan, and then, as the text of Revelation tells us, he emerges out of the abyss, and the spirit reenters his body. And people will think he's been resurrected and will therefore worship him just as they have worshipped Jesus Christ. And so you've got those two scenarios that are kind of battling it back and forth among Christian leaders on all of this. Uh, in what ways does the Antichrist persecute the Jews in the tribulation? Well, one way he does it is through persecuting the two great prophetic witnesses who have the same power as Moses and Elijah. Uh, they, they have miracles that confirm the truth of everything they say, and they're going to be tremendous miracles and they're going to minister for three and a half years. I believe it's the first three and a half years of the tribulation. But then the Antichrist executes them. Their bodies are left unburied, lying in the streets of Jerusalem. And that is an act of contempt. Leave the bodies out in open for people just to behold it. And I'm sure that the uh, uh, videos will go viral on the Internet. People will actually celebrate and give 
Christmas presents to each other as a result of their death. But then guess what? They resurrect from the dead. Now in my mind's eye, I see it this way. They resurrect from the dead and stand up in the streets and they ask, any questions? See? And then they ascend into heaven, you see. And so then great fear comes upon the world. And beyond that, I think that the Antichrist is going to move against the Jewish people in general. And in particular, I think that this is going to happen um, really at, at its most powerful at the end of the tribulation period where the forces of Antichrist are moving against the Jewish remnant. And without going into all the details, the uh, Jewish remnant supernaturally recognizes that Jesus indeed is the divine Messiah. They cry out to him. They mourn for him as an only son. They recognize that truly it is he who is the Messiah and that they have missed it all along. And they cry out to him for deliverance, at which point their deliverance does come at the second coming when Christ slays the forces of the Antichrist. Now, my friends, that's going to be a glorious thing because at that moment, the prophecies of the Apostle Paul uh, about the restoration of Israel in uh, Romans 9 through 11 will have come to pass. Now, I'll close with this. Is the Antichrist alive in the world today? Well, maybe. We don't know. There's going to be one generation of Christians who will be alive on planet Earth when the Antichrist is alive somewhere in the world. You know, if, if it's true that we're living in the season of the Lord's return, then that would seem to indicate that the Antichrist is indeed alive somewhere on planet Earth. Uh, he could be in his 20s. He could be in his 30s. But let me just tell you something that Dwight Pentecost told us when we were at Dallas Theological Seminary. Satan has probably had a man in every generation ready because he doesn't know the future, especially the timing of God's prophecy like God does. And so therefore he's had somebody ready at all times who could be indwelt by and energized by the devil to fulfill the role of the Antichrist. Now the good news, the best news of all, is that the days of the Antichrist will be limited, that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he will return in glory, that he will simply speak the word and the forces of the Antichrist will be wiped out, and the Antichrist and the false prophet will be assigned their place in the lake of fire. You see, And in the end, in the end, not only will the Jewish people believe in the Lord Jesus and enter into the glorious millennial kingdom, but you and I will have already been raptured and we will continue to reign with Christ throughout the thousand-year millennial kingdom. And it's going to be a time of awesome privilege. But I tell you what, because that's coming, because you and I have that destiny, it is all the more important for you and I to be about the business of living righteously, living in purity, and seeking to glorify our Lord in all things that we do. Do not just let prophecy be a mind thing. Let it be a motivation for you to live before the Lord and to serve him in all things. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. He wants me to talk for another half hour, so we're going to go. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> we'll do two quick questions. Two questions. That guy's getting his exercise today, I should say. Okay, my question. Um, yes, you presented some good um, arguments for why uh, Antichrist couldn't be a Muslim, but um, you were saying, why would he... Why would he, um, why would anybody sign an agreement with him? Why would uh, the Muslims want to sign an agreement with Israel? Why would the Israelis trust him? But then there's the principle of taqiyya and lying. <laughs> he's the father of lies. Um, what if he's just, you know, by his great deception and great oratory, what if he convinces them that he's the real deal, but he is a Muslim? I can understand your point. Uh, and there's even... Um, within Islam, justifiable lying. You know, without going into detail, I don't want to take up too much time on it, but uh, there is sort of a situation ethics kind of a system within Islamic theology where certain lies are permissible anyway. The thing is, is the Jewish people know this. And in particular, if you listen to what Netanyahu said just recently, you know, he kind of berated some of the leadership in America for thinking that they could trust Iran. And I remember when I was writing Northern Storm Rising, which is the book about the Ezekiel invasion, 
the more study I did of what political analysts were saying, this is not religious people that have a bias toward Christianity, but, but political analysts, the more I've discovered that over and over again, Iran has promised things that they never intended to fulfill. And as a result of that, I, I think what you have to do is to base your viewpoint on what the evidence really reveals. And if there is a long track record of deceit, then that needs to sort of tell you about what the future might hold. It's like the old story about, you know, the leopard doesn't lose its spots. You know, they, they may claim to be just a pussycat, but in reality, they're, they're a leopard that uh, seeks to kill and destroy. You must also understand the, the religious fervor aspect of what's going on in Iran, because many in Iran do hold to this idea that the imam is coming. In fact, they're running commercials right now that the imam is coming and will soon manifest himself, and that the way to bring that about is apocalyptic violence against the United States and Israel. So in my opinion, no matter what kind of promises they would make to Obama or anybody else, their ultimate goal is global dominion for the Islamic religion, and for that reason, they cannot be trusted. Uh, it makes much more sense to me that a Roman leader, the, re the revived Roman Empire, uh, be, the, be the head, the initiator of this covenant because Israel has no beef with them. Israel has no beef with uh, you know, the leadership that would be a part of this, uh, this European Union, and especially the Antichrist who seems to be able to guarantee Israel a sense of peace and security like never before. The very fact that he will seemingly solve the Middle East problem I think that that in itself is just going to engender uh, you know, a trust that many people have in him. And do not forget one key pivotal fact. Who is it that has the, the ability to blind the minds of people? Satan does. So I think that part of the ministry of Satan during the tribulation period will be to blind the minds of people to the true nature of the Antichrist. So many people are just going to think of the Antichrist as this great charismatic leader. And his true colors don't really begin to shine until, you know, about the midpoint of the tribulation. That's my interpretation of it. I'm sure there's other Christians who may see it differently, but that's how I take it. Okay, one more question real quick. E. The ice man cometh, I see over there. Yeah. <laughs> Can you speak to the, um, the Assyrian? Have you ever heard that, uh, as him being the Antichrist, especially being the eastern leg of the Roman Empire as opposed to the western, which back then it was both, was it not? Uh, it, it was, but the way that I take it is that, uh, you know, in, in Daniel we read about how the Antichrist will emerge from the people that crucified our Lord. He's going to be clearly a Roman. It was Titus and his Roman warriors that overran Jerusalem and its temple, and the Antichrist comes from that very people. And when you look at Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, both of which speak about a revived Roman Empire, that fits perfectly with, uh, with what we know, every, you know about everything else we read about in the book of Revelation. And when you bring Daniel alongside Revelation, it just seems to paint a particular picture of a Roman leader. Um, to me, Scripture interprets Scripture. Uh, I also believe that uh, you know, when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. And to me, the, when, when you follow that kind of policy, uh, you know, the, the Assyrian idea doesn't come close to, to what I believe. Uh, I think that the, this Roman emperor makes a lot more sense. In particular, as you read about the progression of empires in the book of Daniel. You know, uh, what I would recommend that you might do is to take a look at some of what I've written on the Antichrist. There are chapters that I have where I kind of develop how he comes into power and you know, what his true roots are. I discuss all the Bible verses in Daniel and Revelation that talk about that. I think that might help you some. Okay. Thanks, everyone.